Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode six of my series, The Formation of the United States of America, The End of the Constitutional Convention, Plain Honest Men. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. As I explained last episode, once the majority of the delegations voted to accept a supreme national government rather than a federation of states, the rest of the convention consisted of debates over the exact nature of the new government. Two months of lengthy speeches and grudging compromises had produced a framework of a government with a president and a proportionally representative House of Representatives and a Senate with equal representation from each state. A key compromise was the decision of the northern states to accept that slaves would be equal to three-fifths of a free person when calculating the population of a state to allocate congressional seats, accepting slavery in exchange for a stronger national government. The phrase in the episode title comes from convention delegate Gouverneur Morris, who said, While some have boasted it as a work from heaven, others have given it a less righteous origin. I have many reasons to believe that it is a work of plain, honest men. After after two months of hard work, the convention adjourned from July 26 to August 6, enabling many delegates to go home for a break, while the Committee of Detail prepared a rough draft of the new constitution. Not every delegate would return. A good example is New Jersey delegate William Patterson, who only returned to sign the final document. While he was undoubtedly frustrated by his failure to prevent the creation of a more powerful federal government, Patterson was also driven by a strict morality. As New Jersey's attorney general during the revolution, Patterson had energetically persecuted people for fornication, otherwise known as sex outside of marriage, and he had worked to reduce the number of taverns in his state, so Philadelphia must have been unbearable. Since the members of the Committee of Detail were as scrupulous about secrecy as the main convention, and James Madison was not a member, we know even less about their proceedings than the main convention. They clarified several terms, the upper house was called the Senate, and the chief executive was called the President. On August 3rd, the committee gave the report to the publishers of the Pennsylvania packet to print copies for all of the delegates, and again, there was remarkable discretion since the publishers just printed up the copies and did not release any leaks in their own paper. The delegates reassembled on Monday, August 6th, but since only eight delegations had quorum, they promptly adjourned. The Delaware and Georgia delegations were back the next day, so the delegates decided to proceed even though the New Jersey delegates had not appeared. Absence from Philadelphia's humidity and stench for a couple of weeks gave the returning delegates renewed energy. The rest of the month was spent reviewing each of the 23 articles. The tiresome work proved too much for Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut, William Pierce and William Houston of Georgia, William Davey and Alexander Martin of North Carolina, Luther Martin of Maryland, John Mercer of Virginia, and Caleb Strong of Massachusetts, who all left at some point before the end of the convention. Most analysis of the Constitutional Convention focuses rightly on issues like the three-fifths rule, but the clauses on taxation and paper money received less attention, partially because they were not debated. However, those clauses would have major effects on the economic development of the new nation. A key complaint about the Confederation Congress was its inability to levy tariffs, so the Philadelphia Convention passed Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 of the Constitution which gave Congress the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, and to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among several states and with the Indian tribes. Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 15 and 16 gave the federal government the right to call out the state militias to enforce federal laws. And Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 forbade state legislatures from printing money, thus preventing populists from gaining control of a state legislature and printing paper money. The use of paper money had enabled poor farmers to pay off their debts and stay solvent, but it had infuriated many wealthy Federalists because it decreased their wealth, so they were determined to prevent it in the new nation. 
Although Governor Morris strongly pushed for property qualifications to vote, warning that poor people would merely sell their votes to the rich, most delegates disagreed. In particular, Madison argued for universal suffrage, since men should not be bound by laws that they cannot help design. The debate over voting qualifications was settled with another compromise, where the federal voting qualifications in each state would be the same as elections for state legislatures, so women and free blacks could vote if their state allowed it. Actually, New Jersey's state constitution gave adult women the right to vote, although suffrage was limited to single women because married women were not allowed to own property in their name. Realizing that it was August 31st and they were still in Philadelphia, the delegates agreed to hand over the especially thorny parts to the aptly named Committee on Postponed Parts, which had 11 members, each chosen by ballot within each delegation. The state of frustration it probably explains why the committee gave Congress the power to lay and collect taxes, according to the incredibly vague statement, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, giving the central government extreme taxation powers. They also accepted Madison's previously ignored electoral college proposal, where each state would appoint a number of electors equal to the total number of senators and representatives. The debate over the location of the capital dragged on until September 4th when the delegates decided that a state to be determined later would designate an area not exceeding 10 miles square as the seat of the government, therefore that area would not be part of any existing state. The unexpected length of the convention proved to be a problem, since the Pennsylvania legislature opened on September 5th and the legislators needed their hall back, but they were persuaded to use the grand hallway of the state house instead since the convention would soon end. Hopefully. Faced with the possibility that the Electoral College might not reach a majority, some delegates suggested allowing the Senate to choose, which was opposed by small state delegates. Instead, the convention accepted Roger Sherman's suggestion that a deadlocked election would be settled in the popularly elected House of Representatives, but each state delegation had one vote. Sherman also recommended that the vice president spend his time presiding over the Senate, which passed eight states to two, making it clear that the office was minor. On September 8th, they finally agreed that the president could be impeached for bribery, treason, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. Vague, but nice sounding. Tired and hoping to go home eventually, the delegates created on September 8th a committee to revise the style and arrange the articles which had been agreed to by the House. Having authored Virginia's Bill of Rights, George Mason realized the need for a federal Bill of Rights, but not one single state delegation supported him, which again probably had more to do with exhaustion. Honestly, it is understandable. They had been confined to a hot, stuffy room with each other for nearly four months, and a Bill of Rights would take weeks to settle. Finally, the proposal that nine states were required for ratification of the Constitution passed after a debate. The number nine was selected because it is two-thirds of the states rounded up. The article also stressed that any state that refused to ratify the Constitution would not be governed by it. Meanwhile, the Committee of Style was working in the evenings to polish the final document. Four of the five members were obvious choices. Rufus King, James Madison, and Governor Morris had been leaders in the fight for a strong government, while William Samuel Johnson had played the role of compromise, working to find solutions. The selection of Alexander Hamilton as the fifth member seems strange. He had just returned after an absence of several weeks and had only made one real speech, a lengthy call for an English-style government that had been politely ignored. He was probably selected because he worked hard, was a good writer, and was willing to sacrifice his evenings. In fact, the Committee of Style played a key role in the drafting of the Constitution, especially Gouverneur Morris, who reduced 23 articles to 7 and cut the original preamble of we the people of the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, to a simple we the people of the United States. The final draft was finished on September 12th and sent to the printers to provide copies the next day. The delegates then reviewed their copies from September 13th to the 15th. Although Benjamin Franklin and George Washington towered above the other delegates in fame, 
They had remained silent for much of the convention, especially the last month, leaving the leadership to John Rutledge, James Wilson, James Madison, Governor Morris, Oliver Ellsworth, and George Mason. At the end of the convention, Franklin prepared a speech, which he asked Wilson to read as usual, and he gave a copy to Madison. He admitted that he disagreed with parts of the Constitution, but still consented because he expected no better and hoped that the dissidents would doubt a little their infallibility and sign. Washington only spoke briefly at the end. A motion to lower the size of the congressional districts from 40,000 to 30,000 had failed to pass by one vote, so Hamilton and Madison had lobbied the general. When the motion was proposed again, Washington rose and expressed his support, which ensured that the motion was passed without the need for a formal vote. The final vote on the new constitution was 11 to none because Rhode Island had refused to participate, and two of New York's three delegates had left. It was not unanimous within the delegations. Virginia only voted in favor due to Washington's vote. Washington signed first because he was the nominal president of the convention, then the delegates signed by delegation. In total, 39 of the 55 delegates signed, including Hamilton, who was permitted to sign, even though he had no official authority since the New York delegation lacked quorum. Most of the dissidents had already left, so only George Mason, Ulbich Gary, and Edmund Randolph were present but did not sign. It is a bit embarrassing that Edmund Randolph did not sign the final draft since he had proposed the original version. So, the convention had drafted a new constitution. It is important to remember that the final result was far from inevitable. All of the delegates had agreed that the Confederation Congress needed to be strengthened, but why was it replaced by a completely new government? To be honest, the Nationalists had won simply because they stayed for the entire convention. If Lansing and Yates had stayed, their majority would have overruled Hamilton and ensured that the New York delegation voted against a stronger national government. Luther Martin and John Mercer of the Maryland delegation were also opposed to a new constitution but left early, depriving their fellow delegate James McHenry of badly needed support. The compromises between the Nationalists in Pennsylvania and Virginia and the slave states ensured that they usually had a majority, but if Rhode Island had sent delegates and Yates and Lansing had remained, the smaller states would have had two more votes, so several of those compromises might not have passed. Also, it is worth pointing out that while the Nationalists had won, they had not achieved a total victory. Madison had wanted to eliminate state governments completely, and Wilson had failed to implement strict property qualifications to vote. To sum up, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention had disagreed over a number of issues, but had finally accepted a lower house with directly elected representatives and an upper house where each state had two members. The entire convention had lasted for four months, and a sizable number of delegates had failed to make it to the end, but the remaining delegates had finally hammered out a constitution that would create a new nation the United States of America. While the Constitution had been written, it needed to be ratified, and I will discuss the ratification process next episode. Thanks for listening.